screen and then we will start. Yes, that's good. So let me share the screen and then uh, and then we're going to start. So the goal of today, of course, uh, is to finish topic one and hopefully we can finish topic two um, or if not, then most of topic two. Um, so just to quickly recap that what we have done last week, I mean, after the uh, big rain and storm, I hope you are safe and sound and still remember what we have covered, but I guess it's a happy new week. So at least let me quickly review what we have done. So the goal of what we do in the advanced micro theory class is to give you the foundation of what is say the first thing is what is behind the downward sloping uh, demand function right and to give you the idea what you learn in intermediate you have in difference curve uh, how it derives from the preference okay go to more primitive where you can use an experiment for marketing uh, PhDs right or you are going to uh, make a new model then you need to start with new assumptions well, very often when you try to write a model, then you write the utility function, right? And how you uh, make those assumptions in the utility function will be, and should be able to translate them into the preference, which is more primitive, right? So, and uh, that is try to understand the, uh, that is the idea, okay? So, um, maybe I just use a full screen. Um, so the, the, uh, idea is uh, last time we just stopped at the utility maximization problem, which is a constrained optimization problem, and we will lose Lagrangian uh, because uh, we assume preference are monotone. That means the budget constant will binding. Otherwise, you use conductor, and of course, in this introductory thing, we we'll use the standard Lagrangian. And when you really work on things, uh, you impose more constraints or uh, you work a more general problem, then conductor approach will be needed. Okay, for us, we just make it very simple. And here we said we have demand function. Okay, because of you has a one single bundle that maximize your utility, or best for you, and that relies on the assumption that your preference is actually a strictly uh, uh, cosy concave, right? I mean, or your convex, you have a convex preference, right? And then you always find a unique solution that gives us a Marcellian demand function instead of a correspondence. Okay. And based on this, we can derive, uh, and later we'll talk about a little bit more today, it's called indirect utility function, which usually when you uh, write model or you run regression, uh, actually we work on the indirect utility directly some of the time. Okay. Later you will see if we have time, I'll probably use, we should do our game theory model, and some of the time we just assume uh, that directly. Okay. Um, after talking about utility maximization problem, we'll consider the cost minimization problem, which is the due or a similar problem or the same problem with the utility maximization problem, as you will see, and probably you ask why we do that. It's because of, uh, uh, in reality, we often observe how much people spend and the prices rather than utility. So that's why uh, we need to know uh, what kind of restriction we need to put on the expensive function. Later you will see uh, the expensive function will be concave. Okay, I mean, probably you, you try to explain why. And this is the reason why we learn to learn uh, what's the shape of this and why we have this kind of shape and that will guide you when you run regression, right? So that is the idea why we need to learn all this is because when we run regression, right? You often do not run a simple linear regression, right? You have some functional form, right? Contrastic approach or somewhere weird shape, right? Then how can you support those shapes, you need to come from the theory, right? What kind of utility drive you to this kind of shapes, right? And, uh, and last one, probably not very important unless you do policy work or, or you, you do antitrust, is the idea that uh, why 
consumer surplus is the appropriate concepts to measure uh, consumer welfare, right? And then we start from, because when you learn intermediate or principal micro, you're talking about this area under the demand curve, right? And why this is a welfare, right? Because it's not coming from preference, right? Later we see, we are trying to convince you that uh, this consumer surplus is a nice, uh, uh, nice uh, result. I mean, there will be later we learn what we call the equivalent variation on conventional variation and consumer surplus is in the middle of that. And I think it's a good approximation of what we do. And actually that is what the antitrust authority uh, in the uh, US has been doing. Okay. They look at the consumer surplus. If they go up or go down, they will determine whether the authority approved the merger uh, of two firms, okay, and uh, and also if you uh, if a marketing guy or you are whatever you are talking about policy or talking about uh, even for firm, why you care about consumer surplus is because of uh, this is a way of you modeling uh, how uh, consumer like a good, right? There's a shortcut. Okay. You just decide to write down the consumer surplus. It's also uh, the right way to model because. Uh, Instead of talking preference, talk about the surplus, you maximize the surplus, they will go to your saw. So it's, uh, sometimes you model it directly, but uh, we just give you some ideas, some background behind it, okay? So we'll quickly, we start from uh, our consumption set, right? So, so basically uh, what it said is, uh, uh, we consider our choice of the thing we are looking at is a vector, okay? Do remember there's a continuous numbers, uh, a bunch of numbers, and there's some a lot of restriction. You use the numbers, okay? The most important one is in infinite divisibility, and that would be uh, a problem when you only able to consume a discrete number of them, or there's mutual exclusive constraint to that. Okay? For economics, it's not a problem because talking about uh, more or less a market condition or many, many people, so that's why, or over time, so it's not a big problem, but when you apply to marketing situation, uh, we're talking about at that instant or moment, people buy stuff, then this constraint can be binding, okay? Maybe you talk about over one week or one month, that would be a good approximation, but talk about a, that instant where you want to buy stuff, then the integer constraint can be binding, okay? And uh, I'm not going to go to details here, uh, then we start with the preference. Preference is uh, represented as a uh, binary relation, right? Just comparing, uh, basically comparing, give you two bundles, you can tell me whether you like uh, one of them or both, right? Uh, better. And we will make the assumption of complete means that you always can compare. And that means that there's a big assumption here. It means that you know every expat uh, of the details of the environment so that you can make a decision, right? You can't say depends. If it depends, it means that you haven't specified the things correctly. So it means that there's a big assumption, right? Because uh, the decision maker or the consumer know what happened, right? He know exactly what we do and there's to be no regret, right? There's not, no way that he choose this bundle and then, okay, no, 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 I should have chosen the other one, okay? Because it's very clear. Um, the next one is, Transitivity is kind of logical constraint such that you can't say I like x over y, y over z, but you like z over x. Okay, so it's like con it's like consistent uh, assumption. Okay, and uh, if we follow this assumption, we call the agent rational. Okay, of course, uh, this is the rational is arbitrary name, but uh, people think this is rational. Doesn't mean that don't follow this not rational, but. Uh, you do have models and papers that try to uh, study that uh, people don't have this kind of preference. And actually people in the real world, uh, sometimes they uh, can't really realize that they're not rational. And actually the marketing people, I mean, they just try to exploit it, right? You're not rational, then I'm able to uh, make something, right? Uh, trying to, the way, I mean, the way you present the information actually affect them uh, what kind of choice they do, right? Remember, the, uh, one of the famous uh, exercise probably you know, right? If you go to a restaurant, uh, you give you a, give you a 
list of the list of the dishes, especially for the wine, and people tend to order uh, not the most expensive, not the least expensive, to the uh, second least expensive wine. Okay, they don't want to look cheap, but they don't want to waste money, right? They just take the second. But that means that depending on how you make the menu, right, you can make them buy what you want, right? So that's why uh, often a time, right, you see. Uh, firms trying to uh, do the product differentiation in the sense that they try to make good inferior so inferior that you would want to buy the better one right and even it's costly to make the inferior good right so one of the famous thing uh, probably uh, uh, in the history of business is I think it's an IBM or I don't know the printer right uh, I think IBM or or computer company and they make one type of computer is fast okay and and they want to make a cheaper one because they want to cater a little bit market or try to make you buy the better one and but they don't want to produce another cheaper version they just produce the same good but they try to program into the chip such that to make it slower so they add another chip make it slower okay so there is costly to make the more cheaper product, but they make it because if they do it, then you can buy a better one. Okay. So that is the, the idea, right? The, the presence of a worse product make you want to buy a better one, right? So the, your preference is a little bit weird because it's right. Tell you something is inferior, make you buy a better one, right? I think that's a um, related to say the old story, right? Some rich people from China, right? They go to Guangdong Road, Guangdong Road, right? Everyone know Canton Road, one of the most expensive roads in the world. Uh, it's more even more expensive than the Fifth Avenue. It's in Tim Sha Choi, where you have all the luxury shop over there. And uh, there's a very rich guy, many, but anyway, there's a story like this, right? They go to the rich store, uh, they sell the uh, luxury item, and they say, okay, bring me not the best. The most expensive one the more expensive the better right they don't care about the quality they just why want to buy the most expensive one right and and that means that they with the, the, the what they're doing right what their preference is depend on the price right it's not just depend on what the good it is it's just like the more expensive the good then it's better right if so cheap then it's not good okay they depend on price all right so that is that is not rational if you look at this framework right so it means that we have every information uh, we have to describe whether they like it or not it's not dependent on price okay um so here uh just to remind you because someone asked me the after the class is uh what this weak preference okay and it is uh, transitive and complete and it's equivalent you can define Okay, uh, in difference relation and the strict preference or strong preference. Okay, either you can define weak preference. Okay, or you can have a. You tell me what is indifferent to you, what is bad to you. They're the same thing. Okay, and they equivalent. So you can you can do one way or the other. Okay, is that is that clear? Okay, so let me repeat. If I ask you, okay. The weak preference, okay? You tell me which one you weakly prefer to the which one, you give me this information. In another scenario, I don't ask, I just ask you uh, any two bundle, which is indifferent, which one you strong prefer, you get these two information, okay? This first scenario and second are the same, okay? So uh, that is the idea. But uh, in the second scenario, uh, you don't have the completeness, right? Because I just require transitivity to the indifference. I also require uh, transitivity to this strict preference. Okay, but at the end of the day, then you would uh, get back uh, uh, the rational uh, weak preference. Okay, and um, the next is some assumption on the preference. I try to be quick because I don't want to go detail one by one. So, uh, and there's some assumption on the preference. Uh, in particular, we will be using the proof. It's talking about a uh, strong monotone. Uh, it's just like the more the better. I'm not going into details. 
and that also imply your utility function is increasing right, in the northwest direction, so northeast direction. And um, this is continuous. Um, it just means that your preference doesn't change when there's slightly change in your bundle. Okay. So in technical terms, is if there's a bundle x is strictly better than the other bundle y, you just go nearby x and go nearby y. This relation still hold true. There's no sudden change uh, in your preference. Okay, that is actually continuity, right? The same as what you learn continuous in the function, right? And then just like the things keep going on and go on without sudden change. Same idea. Your preference is continuous. That means that there's no sudden change. Okay. And uh, and lexical graphic is the idea that why there's sudden change, right? Because if you change the first element a little bit, right? Can swap, right? So that is the uh, main idea uh, why uh, there's a problem. Uh, and the one the problem why this preference uh, is important is because we often have this kind of preference. Uh, we do because we are simplifying things, right? We do things, we do things one by one, right? And but the problem of this is you don't have a nice uh, utility representation for this one. Okay. And as I remember, I talked about last time how you do the shortcut in application is you, you would argue that there are different types of consumer and you can try check that. Okay. You assume some proportion of the consumer would prefer this and before that, then you can sidetrack that. Right? Okay. So that is uh, one way to do it, but uh, nevertheless, it's important uh, to keep in mind that why continuity is a big thing and it's a big restriction. Okay. And the last one is important is convexity, right? Um, convex preference means that you combine any two bundles, uh, it's better than the worst one. Okay. So that is the, the idea. Okay. And the next is utility function, it's just saying that uh, for each bundle you give a number the higher the number the better so it means that one thing in math is like you're collapsing a multi-dimensional vector into a number right that means that it is not always possible right right and we we said in the proof uh, actually we tried to prove it is when you your preference is continuous right and monotone then you always do it you can always do it right so that is saying uh big thing we talk about and then because uh, utility is just represent order so any transformation would do as well okay so that's a proof i'm not going to uh repeat the proof okay and that uh there are some preference that should translate to the utility i guess uh we don't need to talk more because i think every the proof is very straightforward okay so um What's left is trying to remind you what you learned in intermediate class, right? There are several utility functions that you would want to work on, actually, when you work on the model. And especially when you work on a business model, uh, in theory, this kind of utility function is the thing that you should try first. Okay? And uh, especially, uh, these are the easy. Okay? And then I recommend, actually, you want to work on them. Okay? And... Uh, this purpose of the is just the basic thing at them. Okay. And uh, the other one, Leontief, I think the Leontief is the most easiest, right? Because when your budget is uh, a simple one, then just all the diagonal is the solution. So that means that your optimization problem will be very easy. Okay. And Coplocalus, this I think is the uh, one of the, one of the things that would be most natural one. If you assume, later we don't do it here but if you assume there's only single consumer right if you want to say there's a consumer to represent the whole market which we will do uh, and there's a gap between assuming an individual consumer and a single consumer right uh, we don't talk about this problem here uh but you can check the textbook actually there's a lot of discussion in the literature in the uh, 60s and 70s and 60s sorry 
60 to 80s, there's a lot of discussion of how to extend individual consumer to aggregate consumers, right? Is it possible? I mean, macro have been doing that anyway. You assume uh, we know understand how individual can be modeled by a utility function. That's no problem. The maximize is fine. But is it, is it possible to simplify in a way that there's a single consumer that represent all the consumer? Is that doable? Okay. And uh, there's a big problem here, uh, how to do it. And those who are doing finance, actually there's a problem there, right? Because talk about uh, a consumer, right? Sorry, or the investor is heterogeneous, right? And then they have their own pricing equation. How can aggregate into a capital asset pricing model? Okay. And of course, uh, there are some that if you assume the consumer have certain kind of preference, uh, called the Gola Pullman, Gola Polar form, I mean, somewhat kind of like that, then you can aggregate. Okay. And then, yes. For what? Oh, yeah, yeah, we do. Oh, I didn't mention that. I didn't mention this in the class. Uh, probably I should. I should have mentioned, uh, is it? I didn't mention the first class. Uh, sorry, sorry, I sidetracked a little bit because someone asked me the, uh, I go with the cost outline. So, more quickly. So, the textbook that we are following closely um, you can see the notation also and so forth. If we follow uh, Jet Hill and Randy, so I recommend everyone, if you are confused or you have some problem with my definition or I have typo or whatever, you can check this textbook. This is the textbook, as I said in the first class, is usually used in the master program if you do the uh, econ, okay? But I think it's suitable for our purpose. Even for this one, I think it's more than enough for you guys, unless you want to do theory which uh, say marketing theory, finance theory, then you probably need to do a little bit more. But this one's sufficient, okay? And um, sometimes this textbook is good, but sometimes it's not, uh, you have some further thinking that there's some fundamental thing you want to go, go a little bit deeper. I recommend you to go to Rubinstein book because uh, this gives you the alternate view, as I said. I mean, uh, I recommend that book is, if you think that it's not very clear, then you just book. And again, the last one, this one is the classic standard, okay? If you go to anywhere in the US, most likely this is the book that you're using. And I think recently there's a book, I didn't put it here, it's, um, it's, by, uh, it's by whom? I forget, what's the name? Krebs, yeah, Krebs, Krebs textbook. Uh, Krebs, KL, KL, Krebs, okay. Uh, it's published 10 years ago. Um, he has a old textbook, which is more easier. Okay. The reason one is more difficult, uh, but the good thing is uh, it, ha it contains a lot of appendix and it discuss a lot of technical issues that if you want to look at that, it would be good to know. Uh, but this is the book we're following. And of course, um, we can't follow the whole book because the book is very thick. I mean, you would take two semesters to cover the whole thing. So we just pick up the main thing. Is that, is that clear? Okay, and uh, I'm not. I mean, I'm not covering finance, so I mean, so that's why uh, I don't have a finance uh, reference for that. But the standard finance book actually cover the general equilibrium approach, but uh, we are not. We're not doing that part. Okay. So um. So you have it, it, this utility, then you're done, right? So let's uh get start right so we just go to the utility maximum problem that is the thing we do okay and make sure that you are very clear how you will be doing this because this is the basic building block of everything right we will do this basically throughout the whole semester is maximization uh through some constraint or with or without constraint so that is the main thing of the whole microeconomic theory mainly right you just try to do lagrangian or even, even simpler, right? Do simple calculus, okay? You should be able to do this comfortably, but if you do intermediate micro, that would be something you have done already, okay? I mean, of course, I, I don't assume everyone do intermediate micro, right? So, uh, but 
that we used to be able to do it right because you are a PhD student. Um, so um, first thing we assume the price is positive. I explained last time. If they say zero, it's a free good there. Uh, there will be some corner solution. Okay, so that's why to avoid corner solution. Uh, um, no, sorry, not corner solution, but your price is zero. If your preference is monotone, then you have an unbounded utility, right? Something is free, it's free for you, then it's not consistent. Okay, so, um, so that's why we are focusing on market good, right? If you focus on this case, right? Otherwise, we're talking about air is free, right? So otherwise, uh, there's a problematic thing. But uh, if you look at the textbook, they general, you, allow, you allow more general, but I focus on discussion on easier case, okay? And in the simpler case, I'm, I'm, I just had to emphasize, we are focusing on the budget, it's a linear, okay? And if you do labor or whatever, or more general, it's not, need not be linear, okay? Uh, can be some kind of kink, okay? Or some kind of things that is slightly different, okay? Uh, because here, uh, why it's linear is because the single price that affect everyone, right? You can always buy and sell at the same price. But imagine you have second order price discrimination, right? Which means that the quantity and the price are not fixed, right? The more you buy, the price can be lower, right? That means that this shape is not linear, right? So it'll be something like that, right? So, I mean, if you have this kind of scenario, right, the model will be different, right? Then you have to figure out what would be the solution, right? Depend on whether, suppose it's a linear like in this shape, right? It depend on which area you're looking at, then you find this optimal solution, right? So you have to be very careful, right? We make a lot of assumptions to make things easy, right? But in reality, when you do marketing or you do finance, or whatever, right, you have something slightly more different. Then you have to be careful, right? The standard approach you do, it will be, you have to adjust accordingly, okay? Just to remind you a uh, little bit, okay? And this UMP is the basic thing we do, right? Um, it's maximized utility subject to constraint. As I remind you, we have a very simple linear constraint, right? But in the reality, that will be more than linear, okay? Um, equilibrium exists, and it's unique under strictly cosy concave, okay? And the Barbas law tells us uh, we'll consume the budget. The reason is because monotone, right? If not, then you consume more, right? So do note that I put the proof here is because this is how, uh, this easy one, I just I go a little bit. This is the way that usually uh, a lot of the proof is being written is uh, we do the proof by contradiction, okay? We claim that you will, if monotone, you consume all the budget, okay? How you prove it, okay? We're not doing proof class in this class, but I don't tell you how we do the proof, okay? So that you know what people are doing. But of course, we will never do the proof in either assignment or test unless uh, I got crazy, but anyway. Usually I'm, I'm rational, so probably I, I will not ask you the proof, so don't worry about it. But I try to give you an idea, okay? That's only this one, okay? How you do this proof is, you will do this, suppose not, right? That means that the optimal solution is less than, right? Because Right? If trigger less than, you be contradiction. Why? Because you can always tell, tell that guy to consume a northeast direction, right? Consume more of everything, right? Because there's a budget remaining, okay? Then you can consume more, then it's better, right? So do note that the idea here behind is, is there's a several things, right? It's infinite divisible, the good, right? Because infinite divisible, you can always add more, okay? So that is a, Assumption behind the Wawa's law, right? Because we don't, we don't say it out, but you can see the proof, you realize on what. It means that if your uh, consumption set, right, is not infinite divisible, the Wawa's law may not hold. Right? So you have to be very careful what kind of proof, the proof, what assumption they're using, and what is holding. Okay? So I'm not talking about you need to know the proof because I don't think you need it, but. You need to know uh, how to derive and what are something behind this uh, is important because sometimes you will look at when things doesn't look like the way you saw, this why you do research and how things will be different. Okay. And uh, lastly, this is the thing I think we covered last time is the, we talk about the FOC, right? And why this is true, you look at the Rangian, I think you can prove it pretty easily, right? 
but the idea why this hole is the marginal wear substitution, right? Is same as the price ratio. Just to remind you what's the intuition is the price ratio is the external exchange rate. Okay? You give what good I, you can exchange a good J. This is how you exchange, right? So suppose you give up one unit of good J, right? Then how much money you get is one over Oh, sorry, you give one unit, so you give up one unit of good I, then you, what you get the money is PI, right? And how much uh, unit of good J you can get is one over times one over PJ, right? And this is how you can exchange one unit of I for J in outside market. And the left hand side is MLS, right? It's internally how you trade off within yourself, make yourself remain the same happy as you are, right? That means that if the market always operate and your mind is not crazy, Right? The market's not crazy, the mind, you're not crazy, then you can always make sure that you're equal. Okay? And this is Lagrangian, right? You should be able to write that down, and you should be able to see uh, this give you the FOC. Okay? And do note that when you write this equation, FOC, we assume the interior solution is the right thing. Right? Otherwise, you have the Lagrange, you, have, you would have the Lagrange, you would have the conductor, right? And one thing I want to emphasize as well is uh, the other way of writing the FOC is writing the marginative wealth, okay? And which is one important thing is the lambda, which the Lagrangian multiplier, because we often, when we do optimization problem, the Lagrangian uh, multiplier, we think things we want to interpret, okay? And uh, this is you can write in this way right it's just like the utility that you uh, get when you have one more unit of uh, income and this is coming from the envelope theorem as well right this is the idea right it's the d d uh, d u d y right and just to reassure you that why it's important to talk about intuition is because when you write a model you can't simply give foc and that's it okay people would not be happy if you do that okay even if you write empirical paper, you have modeling section, you can't just give FOC and just go away. Okay? You have to explain. Okay? So suppose you go to dates with your girlfriend or boyfriend, right? So suppose, girl, suppose girlfriend, right? You can't simply just give a flower and go away. Right? You have to give a flower with a card there. Otherwise, who, who knows what you're going to do? Right? Then just, just go. Okay? Just like it's not complete. So you have to explain why this FOC is true. What's economic intuition behind it? So for every model you learn in the future, I mean, I hope this class tells you that you should, even though you don't understand what's going on in the proof, you should be able to see the FOC, okay? Why this is true in words, okay? That's the, I mean, although I don't ask you, probably I don't ask you in the exam or whatever, but I, paper may I ask you, but this should be something that you should know how to explain, okay? That's very important, right? Otherwise you don't, you don't actually know what's going on unless you know I mean, the proof you may, you may not need to know, but it's not important, but the FOC is able to explain. Okay? Just like if you run regression, right? You don't need to know what's going on in the R and data, how the black box get the estimation, right? At the minimum, you're able to understand this table, that the star there, how to explain that, right? What is the interpretation, not just the star, right? If suppose people ask you what is the economic significance, right? Suppose you increase X by 1%, what do you mean by increase Y by how much? Right? Because OLS may be easy, right? If logic, logistic, or probit model, then you have to explain what those they are. Same idea here, right? Because FOC is just like giving this table, right? They tell me how to interpret this thing. Okay? So this, uh, uh, this tells you if you make this assumption, the FOC is just the uh, optimal solution. Okay? And it's unique, so that's why in this graph, it's like in difference curve and the uh, budget line, the optimal solution turned out to be the tangent one, right? And there's a unit one, okay? And this is called the Marcellian demand function. And do note that I call function, it automatically means it's a unit one, okay? And you look at the, some of the book that will take correspondence. When say correspondence means that there's more than one bundle, right? If, you're, if your utility is like something like this, right? Then you can have, uh, I, should, I, should, I should draw here. Right, if your utility is like this, it's a weird shape, then you can have two bundle. Okay? But the way that this doesn't appear, because it violates 
which assumption we make. The blue one evaluate what assumption we are making. No one can tell me. We assume the preference are cosy concave, right? Right? So that's that's the reason. So um last time I will just stop here, okay? So uh here uh this is several property, okay, here. And unfortunately the demand function is have a very little property we can say. The only thing we can say for sure is homomorphism degree zero. Okay? The reason is the budget line is when you double the price, you double the endowment, you should have the same result. Right? Just by the scale invariance in terms of how you draw it, right? Just like uh, here, right? Uh, right? You double the price, double the uh, endowment, right? Exactly the same line you observe. Right? So that's the idea behind why this holds true. Of course, you can prove it. Um, but you can see uh, the compressed statics, right? How the demand function changes with prices and endowment or the income. Actually, you can't say anything from theory turn out to be okay the thing we want to have is when we remember the first one is we want a downward sloping demand okay turn out that starting from preference okay actually you can't do it okay actually the downward sloping demand is actually not coming from cannot actually coming from from theory purely unless you're willing to assume certain things okay from basic rationality actually you can't say anything okay um but I, I mean, in, in practice, you know, downward stopping demand will hold most of the time, right? Except the case I mentioned to you, right? When the rich guy, too hard, right? Go to, uh, go to a uh, luxury store, he want the most expensive thing, right? The more expensive, he want more, right? In that case, right? That is completely violate the downward stopping demand, right? The more expensive, he want more. Of course, within certain range, right? Then it's, uh, it's kind of not ordinary good, right? Right? Uh, and but in reality for business, right? So you can all, you can assume that we all we are considering the case where things are ordinary, right? The price of your good goes up, right? You should have a demand less. Okay? Otherwise you can keep going the price, right? That's easy. Right? And income good, this is a change of y compared statics, right? And is uh, most of the time, right? Your income goes up, then uh, demand of your good would go up, right? Your income go down, the demand of good go down is normal good, right? But uh, inferior will be your demand, your income go up, then you you would demand less, right? These days, right? We know uh, we call the downgrading of our consumption, right? Self Zhang Ji. So that means that uh, you would consume more of. Uh, La Tiao or whatever thing that would be a selfish, it's a selfish challenge, right? It's like, uh, now also very famous thing, right? Probably you know, I mean, everyone has been you know, above 18 years old, right? You know, there's a Luckin coffee shop, right? He, they with the Mao Tai, right? They serve a coffee with Mao Tai. And why you would that happen, right? People said this is a selfish challenge, right? It's a downgrading of your consumption, right? Because Mao Tai, right? It's very expensive, right? But now people don't have money, right? How can you want to consume some Mao Tai, then how you do, right? Just buy the thing, right? So that is the idea, right? It's an infer inferior good, right? In that sense, right? When you income lower, you consume more of those, okay? And the next one is called complement substitute, right? To marketing people, that is very important, right? So you, you are trying to sell different goods, right? You try to lower the price of one, can boost the sales of the other, right? That's a compliment, right? If you, otherwise you have suffered here, right? And I already explained last time why the Tesla, right? Is lowering the price of uh, his basic car, right? Actually he's increasing price of other thing, right? I mean, uh, other, other AI thing, right? Uh, there's some several reason behind it, right? But one of the, you can explain is compliment, right? Uh, and also price discrimination, right? Because they have a competitive edge on 
those uh, AI or self-driving, those kind of things, right? They can charge a higher premium for those, but the car itself is getting more competitive, so they lower the price for that. But anyway, and also lower the price for that can boost the sale on those uh, high-tech add-on, right? So these are the reason, right? The complement, right? And one of the famous things probably you would notice the complement use is in business is the firm would charge very low price for your printer, right? You buy the printer, computer printer, it's like so cheap, you can't believe it, right? Just like basically almost zero, zero, zero price, right? But the ink, or the cartridge they charge is so expensive, it's as most as expensive as the machine, right? The reason, right? Somewhat the complement idea, right? But anyway, uh, as I said, uh, because this model cannot say a lot, right? That's why our marketing class they can make a lot of money because you have to get to get the research on those, right? Because there's nothing can be said too much about those, okay? And this Lagrangian problem uh, for a cryptocurrency utility, um, I'm not going to detail because you're able to do it, and I will make an assignment that you work on similar problem, okay? Because I guess you're able to do it, okay? Uh, and I'll make an assignment, so I'm not going to step by step, but it should be easy to be easy, okay? And as I said, this is a uh, normal good, right? Your income goes up, you consume more, okay? The inferior look like this, you go up, you consume less, okay? So that is the idea, okay? And this is ordinary good, okay? If you, uh, the price goes down, you consume more, okay? And here is given good, the price goes down, you consume less. Okay, and I don't know if I write that down here, but you can decompose it. Uh, this kind of change into two parts: income effect, the substitution effect, right? And this is the comparison of two effect. Actually, uh, which one is bigger, right? Uh, income effect is so large, right? It's inferior good uh, that you would the in income effect overrun the substitution effect, right? Uh, that would in this way, okay? It, and the non-existence in empirical part on this actually imply one thing, right? Because there's a two, always two things, right? Substitution effect and income effect, right? And that means that the substitution effect is usually stronger than income effect. Uh, but this you learn in the intermediate micro anyway. I don't know if I have put it there in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the slides, but you can look at the book, I mean, but the reason that I don't put it in the slide is because I never actually use it, the equation, so that's why I don't want to put it there because even I'm not using it, then I suspect you don't use it as well. Okay. Um, last one is how you define gross complement and gross substitute. Um, the definition is just like the total differentiation. Do you know that this is different from the parcel? Okay. Uh, one of the reasons why it's total is because this one, you, this is change in price of good J, right? Because change of price of good J actually affect uh, the consumption of good J, right? And that actually will translate it to uh, that, okay? It's indirect, so that's why it's like this way, okay? It's written this way. But uh, you can forget about the derivatives because uh, we are not actually working on calculus on that, but I just put that because this, you can find this in the book. Okay, and we don't, I don't talk about that, then it's not very important. Last one, talk about the elasticity. It's not important uh, in theory most of the time, but it's important when you do regression, right? Because that is actually you do, right? You take log on both sides and you run the regression. And that's the most common thing you do, right? And, um, um, and one of the things that I want to mention elasticity is because of this function, okay, the CES, and this is the most commonly used uh, functional form, at least of now, in uh, empirical work, okay? You always assume your utility follow this kind of additive form, okay? Each good raised to a certain power and added together. It's additive, okay? And it's so common that almost you pick up any, almost you pick up anything in the, in the tray or macro, this is the one, okay? Uh, they have a even recently they have even more crazier version. It's like 
double CES. It's like CES on CES. Uh, but anyway, uh, we don't need to bother. But one thing is why this is so common, because this is so versatile. It includes all the cases we discussed. If you consider Professor Matthew, Cobb Douglas complement, they all include. So that's why one size fits for all. Okay? And this is the thing that you would be using when you do empirical work. This is the standard thing. Uh, okay, so that's why I include that here. Okay? And uh, that's, that's why I put this one. Okay? And of course, uh, one, and one interesting point why this is so common in the empirics is because your run parameter which you can estimate, right? So you can know whether consumer behave in what way, right? If you, you just, you have the data, how much they consume, what the price they are, right? Then you can actually estimate this kind of stuff, okay? Um, and I'm not going to talk about elasticity, this kind of stuff, but I think that is something you learn in the, in the principle. And I don't think it's very important anyway. Just some definition, so I just skip, okay? And that's the same thing, okay? And uh, income is the same thing. So I'm not going to uh, talk about that, okay? And uh, okay. And let me introduce this and we'll break. Sorry, it's almost, I should give you a break. So um, just this slide, then we'll break, okay? So um, here we come to the last thing. Uh, for the UMP is called the indirect utility function. Okay, just basically you look at the utility. Okay, okay. instead of the uh, instead of the what the bundle is. Okay, or uh, simply you can put the Marcellian demand into utility. That's what we have. Okay, let me repeat what it is. Is here the indirect utility function is you give them the price, you give them the income then I can tell you how happy you are. Okay? Let me, re let me restate it. The Marcellian demand is what? You give the price and income, I tell you what is the best you can consume. Okay? And the indirect function is directly tell you that give the price and income, which you can observe, they tell you how you map to your happiness. Right? And as I mentioned earlier, usually this is the Function you run regression on, right? It's easy, right? The price and income you know actually, right? And one more minute, one more minute. Ah, so yeah, I should give you a break. Okay, now, let's talk about it after 15 minutes. There's a property here, but we'll talk about it after the break. Okay, so 1045, we zoom. Just wait one second to do the announcement. He's sick, I said. That's okay, but they come back. Oh, they, uh, give me the uh, MC, then I just say, okay. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. I didn't see rollers okay. That's why I, I was not in the blackboard. You're not in the blackboard? Yeah, so can I? Oh, you can add you there? Yeah, that's just enter me. That's no problem. Uh, you have to let me know your. Uh, your type in your. Just wait 10 seconds. Oh, oh. I need your uh, ID. Yeah, Just have your ID then. Yeah. Yeah. To be there, you can check. Let me know if you are uh, any problem. Oh, I'm
就是你从这个系统里就可以看到这个是的皮皮了是的但是本来不是它就存在在那个 就是慢慢推，然后最后有一些东西能弄成像狼的，就是个。就是还有个问题，就是就是那个就是preference，就是那个毛台的preference，它是比那个Lucky Coat 要大。所以。毛台是就是那个。哦，对对对对，但但是一点点而已。对，一点点，但是我们那个preference不是说呃，它strictly
个媒体的，我怎么要讲的？没有办法，没有办法，放弃。就是这个问题，没有问题，没有问题。我以为是可以。没有，没有，没有，没有。东方话都行的。啊，好，好认识哦。而且全是假的。对对对对对对对。好好好。好好好。呃，我建议我们要终极微观的话，你可以看，呃，呃，它一本，它这个是 advanced， 它一本 intermediate， 就是 intermediate， 那该怎么讲？呃，其实如果你懂得算，你不懂，我没有特别，我没有 assume 什么，就是没有 assume 特别多的东西。呃。嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯那可能就要看你终极版那个版面，就是它有一个 intermediate， 可以看这个，看这个，它就会讲的比较低头，但是我们只用的很小部分，后面跟费的东西不一样，或者是你可以看这个。
Um, so it's time, uh, 10.45. So uh, during the break, some of you asked me uh, if you want to consult the uh, intermediate micro, if you want to take a look, then one book that I recommend would be the intermediate. This is a uh, very intermediate. So uh, no calculus, basically. But there's some calculus in the appendix. And if you want something serious one, probably some of you may have done that is the uh, is the uh, I forgot is uh, I forgot which book uh, there's another book by uh, I think Osborn I think Osborn and Rubinstein that I should I should have put that there I think it's model in Michael model in Michael economic theory uh, yeah I mean this book is also um, it's a free book uh, you can download from the internet I think this book is a book that uh, tell a lot of stuff okay it's more intermediate and it's mathy enough that uh, is you can connect that to our class but I, I guess it's you read the uh, Jatir and Randy that should be fine I mean I mean the, Remember, it's not more the better, 
you pick up one book and stick to it is easier than you move around the books. Okay, so uh, that's why I don't want to introduce more because uh, I mean we have mental constraint, right? So it's not always the more choice the better. Okay, but anyway, any book will work, right? Because what we cover is very elementary. Okay, so um, just to remind you what we have done is we look at the indirect utility function and. The reason why I look at that is because uh, these are observables, right? We observe prices and income, and there's a reason why this is the function that we use actually in, in reality, right? Because the Marcellian one is very difficult, right? But this one is easy, right? You model from the indirect utility, right? Rather than model the Marcellian demand, right? How can you estimate the Marcellian is more difficult? Estimate this one, it'd be easier, okay? Um, and there's some assumption here. Um, first is uh, non-decreasing income and non-increasing in prices, right? That's very natural, right? The more income than you have here, right? Cannot be making it worse, right? The price goes up, can you can make you uh, happier, okay? And why is this good? It's because you avoid the problem of the Marcellian demand, right? Marcellian demand, the price can, in, in theory, right? Need not down stop paying. Right? Because it's given good, right? Remember that we said. But here it's monotone. So when we're in a regression, our life is easier, right? You know the you know the sign of your regression. Right? So much much simple. Okay? And uh, uh, there's a XT XT0 double the price and income and same, right? And last one is the raw identity. I I don't think everyone ever use it in the other than deriving things, right? But uh, this is just like change in price affecting your utility and change in the income affecting. Uh, this is just, the proof is very simple. It just, uh, uh, just div division. So, but I don't think it's important. So I just, I would just skip it. Uh, you will often see that when you see proofs, but it never, I never, and can't in case you actually use it anyway. So that's why I just try to skip. If you, you're interested, you can look at it, but uh, uh, I don't see there's a uh, much thing. Ah, uh, then historically, it's a rather important discovery, but I don't see the reason why I want to talk about it. But uh, probably the only important thing is when people talk about raw identity, then you know what it's referred to. And to look, at, look back, then you know what's going on. But I don't think I ever use it. At least in the consumer side, I never use it. Um, yeah, probably I never use it. Um, maybe one way to use it is if you estimate the indirect function, okay, from your model, then you can uh, back out your demand based on that. But other than that, I don't see the reason why uh, this is very useful. Okay, so this is the function, right? You can tell you how you can derive the indirect function. I mean, you will you do this assignment later, so I don't. I'm not going to cover it. You can check it if you want to. Okay. So we come to the uh, second part is uh, expenditure function. We're going quickly because everything is very similar. Okay. We don't want to spend too much time on uh, talking about the things, but uh, here is the definition of the problem. Okay. It's important. It's just like uh, if you learn linear programming, right? That's swapping between the constraint, right, and the objective function, right? And uh, in the utility maximization problem, right, you just hold your budget the same, you move in different curve, right? Here is reverse, right? You keep your indifference curve, move your budget, such that uh, you spend the less to achieve the optimal, right? You can see if your, if, this constraint is a single but single constraint, right? This is a direct one to one, the same, right? And you have multiple constraints, then the things will be may not hold, right? Doesn't hold, okay? And uh, this is the uh, uh, things, okay? And do note that this u upper bar is a parameter model, okay? So here, utility maximization problem is you give me the prices. And the target utility you want to achieve, okay? I give you how much you should spend, okay? So that is the 
it's a maximization problem. Okay, so minimization problem. And one thing is very simple. You would expect that as well. Is price a positive, and your preference is monotone. You consume uh, uh, the utility must be binding, right? You will not consume more than so you don't achieve. You don't achieve more utility than you your target, right? Because you can reduce your consumption, right? The same argument, same as the Vavas law, right? So there's a counterpart Vavas law here. Right? The proof is the same. I mean, it's a mirror mirror proof, right? And what I want to say is this problem, if you derive it, okay, very simple, you're able to do it, is to show you the FOC, the same thing. So that's why the same problem. The FOC again tells you your MRS, same as the price ratio. Okay? How to prove it is very simple, right? Just the, uh, if you take this, right, you just, uh, the same outcome here, right? The only thing is this guy, right? Look at the, the main difference between the UMP and EMP is the constraint, right? It's the same, right? I don't see uh, you would have a big problem on that. And the solution, okay, uh, the optimum bundle that you are working on, okay, to minimize your budget to achieve utility U bar, this guy is called the Hexian demand, okay, and uh, or commercial demand, and this is different from the Marcellian demand you look at, okay, because the Marcellian demand is looking at the price and income, right? Given the price and income, you tell me how much you consume, and Marcellian is you give me the price and utility, what, uh, what bundle you are buying, okay? Not holding the budget the same, okay? The budget can vary, right? But uh, and um, that is the uh, main thing, okay? So there is uh, uh, two property we focus on, but many more. But this is the two property we look at it. The first one is very simple. If you change the price, double the price, okay, you consume the same, okay? The reason is you don't hold your uh, income fixed. Double the price doesn't really matter because in order to achieve the same utility, you are the trade of the same, right? Because remember the MRS, same as the price ratio, the optimal condition, right? The EMP always, or the UMP or EMP, right? No matter you maximize utility or minimize your budget, the optimal condition is what? MRS equal to price ratio, right? So here, there's no difference between the price ratio, no change in utility trade-off. You do the same thing always, right? So that's always whole, okay? No, but the, the main thing about the Hexian demand is, uh, is this, okay? Is the Hex, uh, if you have Hexian demand, it's always downward sloping, okay? In some sense, Economists are right, right? If you talk about hexane demand, hexane demand is always downward sloping. Okay, and uh, what is missing? If you look, you know, intermediate micro, right? What's missing in this one is income effect, right? Because income not holding constant, right? So the substitution effect is always negative, right? That's what it means, right? But I don't think, I don't think, do we have the equation? I, I'm not, I'm not sure. So this is the hex, you can derive the hexian demand, okay? This is some of the assignment you will do, but I think even you are in peace program, you be able to do this. If not, you'll be your assignment. Right? So it shouldn't be an issue. But anyway, of course, you have a problem, you can email me or the TA, so you're able to solve it, okay? I assume you're able to do it, okay? Because of the time, I mean, I don't think I can go one by step by step, but in case you confuse, ask me in the break, I can, I can go over that with you. And here we call the net substitute because uh, uh, it just uh, the gross we have double C now we have C we have the net thing okay just look at the the things without the sub income effect okay um, so lastly this last equation is the expenditure function right it's the same as the 
in direct trade function, right? You just put the hex and demand into the expenditure, okay? And uh, as I said, uh, this is likely to be the one that uh, you usually estimate on, right? You have expenditure of people, right? People try to achieve certain utility, okay? And um, I get this a graph. I don't think I need to talk about that, right? But this is basically just uh, this is the ex expenditure over that, this utility, right? And you can see if you have Marcel and demand, the same thing, right? If everything follows, okay? Um, so there is uh, several property here. The first one I think is very simple, right? If you double the price, your expense will be double, right? Because you keep consuming the same bundle, Right? Because double the price doesn't change the price ratio. Where the price is the same, right? And because things become more expensive, everything double, right? Your consumption double. So that's why it's HD1, right? What do you want? I mean, uh, this HD31, I think you learned it from your math cam, right? So that's the one, just as definition. I mean, if you don't like this one, this is, the, this is what it means, right? It's nothing. Second thing is very simple, right? Your expenditure is increasing in non -de non decreasing in uh, price. Okay. The last one will be uh, the second. The third one is a little bit uh, interesting. It is saying that okay, uh, is concave in price. Okay, means that you give me two price vector. Okay. You look at the average of what we consume is less than the average price vector. Okay. And this look uh, a little bit crazy, okay? And I want to give you an idea of how we prove it, okay? Because this is how people prove this concavity and convexity, I think. The idea is very, don't worry, the proof is very simple. Very, very simple. So let me prove this here, okay? I just only prove this. So consider the case you only have one good, okay? Holding other thing constant, okay? Now, this is the price, right? Suppose this is your, uh, how, this is your, uh, okay, you consider all the and change, okay? You keep, if you only change the price, okay? You're holding all other bundle the same, consumption the same. So how your expenditure change will be according to this line. Right? You keep your bundle the same. So price changes, you still consume the same bundle. Okay? And then it means that your expenditure will be following the red line because linear. Right? Linear in the price because you keep all your consumption the same. Okay? The red line, then we repeat the re repeat is if I change the price P1, okay? P2 up to Pn the same. And your bundle mean the same, okay? You don't change your bundle, okay? Of course, it's not optimal, but it's not optimal. The red one will be your expenditure. Is that okay? Because linear, okay? But remember, it's not optimal, okay? That means that your actual consumption bundle will change accordingly, right? You will do some substitution, right? That means that it will be below, right? Because you will be, say, because this is more expensive, you would consume some other thing that's less expensive, you would substitute that, right? So it must lie below. So that's why it's concave. So that's a proof. Okay, of course, there's a formal proof, but this is the proof that you try to explain why this is a concave. And this is ideally, you will try to prove things whether concave or not, okay? It's look at if not optimal, okay? You change will be linear, right? And if optimal, whether you go up or go down, that's how, how you usually you look at the thing. I mean, I mean, as I said, I mean, it's black, so it's not approved, so it doesn't really, you need to worry about this, okay? And the formal proof is like this, but I don't think we need to know the proof, right? Last is a surplus number, as I said. Uh, do I use it anymore? Oh, not really, but uh, if you're able to estimate the, Expand the function, you take the derivative, then you get the demand, but uh, 
I never, I seldom see we use it in the practice, so I just don't talk about that much. But it just sent that uh, envelope theorem, right? I don't see anything more than that. Okay. So the surface lama. Uh, the only useful thing is you estimate the expected function from regression, then you take the derivative, then you, you get the demand. So the only thing you idea is like um, why you have a surface lama and raw identity is because if you estimate them, you uncover your demand function. So that's why it's being famous is because you actually estimate that, then you can just back out your demand. So because what you get from people is the consumption data, right? You can back out all those kind of things. Right? That's the reason why uh, it's famous in empirics, but unless you really do in this dimension, so you don't really worry about those. Okay? And this is the example. You work on this, so I'm not going to cover. And um, oh, I have this, okay, the RT issue. Um, very simple. Um, it is basically saying how the EMP and the UMP are related, right? But you know it exactly they're the same thing, right? Because one is holding the budget, you move in difference curve. The other is holding the difference curve, you move the budget. And in optimal, they're the same thing, right? So that means that uh, if you put the expenditure function, this way, interesting, you put the expenditure function into this Marcellian demand, you get the Hexian demand, okay? And then you have the Hexian demand, you put in, in, the, in the directed function, you got the Marcellian demand, okay? And of course, it's only useful when you actually want the regression, you estimate them, you can go back to the other one, right? So that's the reason why they're important, right? And lastly, I often mention this, right? Is, uh, is how the Hexian demand and the Marcellian demand related, right? This is the Marcellian demand, this Hexian demand minus this guy, and this is the Marcellian demand price effect. This is what usually we call the substitution. And this is the income, if, this income effect, right? So basically the Marcellian demand, right? Is the Hexian demand plus minus the income effect, right? So this is usually we call total equal to uh, substitution effect and income effect, right? This you learn from intermediate micro, but this is the calculus version, right? And yeah, I don't talk about that much because I mean, that's not much you usually do other than you clarify this concept, right? Uh, of course, if you look at the mass call, the green, they will tell you the hexian matrix. Uh, this kind of thing can have something to say, but I, I don't think we are that technical. So that's why we, we keep here, right? There's some kind of a restriction um, called say angle aggregation, corner aggregation. There's some within this framework, you can do some restriction on how this thing can be and you help you estimation. But I guess no one in this room ever will be doing this kind of estimation anyway. So that's why I just keep. But if you want to know the textbook mask algorithm, they give you so many pages of handling the matrix, you have fun on that, okay? I don't think anyone would be doing that anyway. So, I mean, that's why I just skip, okay? That's why I, don't, I didn't even mention this in the previous pages. But you should be able to know, right, why we have two different demand functions, right? Actually, they're well connected, right? Because the Marcellian effect, the Hexian effect plus the income. Okay, I hope this will make things clear. Um, and this is the diagram, right? You see intermediate micro, right? So this is the original price, right? This, maybe I should show here, right? This is the original price, uh, original budget, right? And this is new budget, right? And originally, you are consuming this guy, okay? And now you consume here, okay? And from purple to orange, okay? The big jump, okay? And you can always decompose it into two parts, which we call the substitution effect income effect, right? 
The substitution effect is you hold the utility same, you move along to the new price, right? The exactly hexian demand, right? Hexian demand or compensated demand is you keep your utility same, right? So that means that this is the first part, right? It's very nice, right? The red is substitution effect. It's always negative. Uh, in this case, positive, right? Because the price goes down, right? It's always improve. You your good one always goes up. Right? It's positive substitution effect, right? Because the price goes down, right? And the rest is you move here up Y income effect because the price are cheaper, right? That means that implicitly your income higher if you consume good one, right? So that's why it go up the blue one, okay? So this. Of course, it's very trivial if you learn intermediate micro, but it is so one thing very important is when you do analysis in theory or in model, you often see total effect, right? And your model derive, okay, this affect this in this way. We often, if this is trivial, then you don't explain, right? But we often, your model will have a, a lot of moving part. You want to decompose it in multiple component. This is a very good way to show you can Divide it in two parts, and turn out this part is very nicely connected with your hexane demand, right? So that's the reason why we learn two problem is because they help us to clarify what is the impact when there's a change in the price for Marcellian demand, right? You can tell, okay, this is the part come from the hexane substitution effect, the part come income effect, and in reality you can estimate the two separately, right? And your model you can tell uh, the two parts, right, as well. So it's a very common approach. When you do IO or marketing, right? Uh, there's a multiple park, and then you can try to see compressed statics, you divide them into multiple parts. You can explain detailly uh, how things go on. And very often, these parts are different size. Okay, you, this here is the same size for the same direction. But in reality, there's a lot of model, things are competing, right? This is why it's ambiguous, right? There's a lot of time when you do derivative, right? You do compressed statics is Okay, this depends on what, right? And when you say things depends on the parameter, it's best to say you decompose in multiple parts, right? And then you can say this is ambiguous, this is unambiguous, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a very useful way to do it. I mean, when I learned it, I didn't know this is very nice technique. But when you when you read more model, then you see actually you can see this kind of decomposition is very often you see, okay? Because you have a long derivative, you can divide them in multiple parts. So this is a rather useful technique. I mean, of course, uh, uh, is that okay? Is that clear what we're doing? As I said, I hope that you learn this model is not just by learning the model, but rather than learning how we present the model, how we analyze the model. And this is the thing that carry with you, because if you're not, not learning, not teaching this class, the model, te the model, the definition is not very useful. But the modeling technique will be very useful, right? Because this is how people analyze. And this framework has been used more than 20 or 30 years, right? People use the same framework. So it has been survived for a very long time. If you believe in market, right? This is a good way to analyze things. Okay? I hope that is clear. Okay? And this is a proof. I'm not going to prove it. Um, so one thing is uh, very quickly is uh, you will see uh, which curve is more steep depending on normal group inferior. Okay? I'm not going to explain, but uh, the idea is, I mean, I explain it a bit. Uh, say, I, I only explain this, this side, I'm not explaining this, that, that side. You should be able to do it, okay? Why the, uh, the compensated demand is uh, like this way? The reason is, look at the price goes down in this way, right? There's total effect, right? And normal good, right? Price goes down, your income effect is positive, right? So go back from, Marcel and Hexian, you just subtract the income effect, which is positive, so go this way. Okay? So same for the other one. And same for this guy. This reverse. Okay? I mean it's black, so if you don't get it, it's fine. Okay, just stay. Is that okay? I mean, you can ask me the break if you still don't get it. Okay? But this is something not complicated. Oh, the reason I'm quick is because uh uh it's not because, it's just, it's just because uh, we don't use it that often in practice, so I just quick, okay? I quick is just because uh, 
in the economics can be a lot of importance, but for every case it's not important, so I just try to be quick. I focus on things is more important, right? Um, here is um, welfare changes, okay? And the question is asking if you try to make changes to the model, uh, what you get, right? If you have utility, uh, uh, you get the price and income, you change in price, change in income, uh, what you would get, uh, and uh, and change in utility depends on all this, okay? And you can, this is uh, coming from the FOC, right? It's lambda PI, okay? You take lambda I, then change in utility, okay? Proportional to that is based on uh, proportional change in price, okay? What does that mean? It means that if you try to change some prices of people, okay? And how does it affect their utility, okay? It depends on original price and how much they change their consumption, right? Then, then they tell you, okay? And uh, this is the way that you usually estimate, but as I said, this is technical. So we'll focus on the one for large changes, okay? This is the one we use it because we want to tell you the foundation for using consumer surplus. Remember in the mini micro, how you measure surplus of consumer is the area under the demand curve, right? If you still remember, hopefully you do, is you have a P, Q, okay? It's a line. Do note that this is not the demand function. This is the inverse demand function, okay? Because demand function is Q given P. So it's tau I join this way is P given Q. So it's the inverse demand function, right? And um, so what we do is, right, this is the, if this is the equilibrium price, okay? And, or the price actually, then this is, the red area will be the consumer surplus, right? This is, you learn it in your microeconomic principle or intermediate class, this is the standard thing, right? So, but why this is the welfare, right? You never explain, just we define this as the case and we just say, okay, because you're going to pay this much, you only pay this much, this is your welfare, right? But this is not quite right because it's not coming from preference, right? So we are trying to start thinking from preference to explain why this can be an approximation, okay? And turn out, actually, later we'll see there are two ways to measure it. And consumer surplus is intermediate, okay? So let's get started, okay? So do you know that we will have some notation that make, make sure that your mind is clear. So you have to twist your mind a little bit. Yeah. I'm sorry, but this notation is not invented by me, but the book also very confusing. But anyway, I try to make that less confusing as possible. So we start with a price vector. Say when I have bond fund, then it's a list of prices, okay? P0, okay, bunch of prices and your initial income, okay? And now suppose I change the price only, income remain the same, okay? And the question is, is consumer better off or worse off? How to do it? It's very common because this is the thing that when government impose tax tariff or impose sales tax, right? Or do whatever thing that will change the price. Okay. And uh, the question is asking whether people get better or worse off, right? So, the idea here, actually, there are two ways to measure how bet, better off or worse off, depending on your perspective. What's the reference point, right? Actually, go back to the idea of I don't know, by Einstein relativity, who you observe, which reference point you're looking at. Okay? So suppose you're looking at conventional variation, okay? looking at making the guy as well off as before, so look at beginning, we have price zero, 
income Y. So this V, right, is how happy he initially, okay? This is our reference point, how happy initially. Then we try to look at the case where under the change is P1, okay? And this is income, okay? How much we need to compensate him, okay, for the change, okay? Put it this way. Suppose the price um, goes up, okay? Then we need to compensate him, right? So that's why it's negative amount, so it's negative, negative, become positive, right? Because price goes up, right? Need to pay him more, so we need to see it to be negative. Don't ask me why negative, because this is the stand, the, the way that people define the old days, okay? I don't know why they do negative amount, but okay, just negative. Okay, I'm not going to challenge the, the definition in the, right? You, you should be, plus it's more natural, right? But anyway, they, they do it this way, okay? But what they think about price, they think about price cut or somebody, that would be natural, right? If somebody them, then you would have to take away the money from them, right? Then it's be positive. So, but you see the idea here? How much you need to, you need to give him so that in the new situation, that is same as the old one. Is that clear what it is? Okay, so make him go back to the old. So that's why it's compensating, okay? And the other one is, you, the reference for looking at is ex post, okay? Looking at after a change, how happy they are, okay? And you are trying to see, right, how happy they are compared to the case where originally, okay, how much you want to give them, okay? Which means that how much you need to give them, okay? He is going to avoid these changes, okay? Right, suppose your price goes up, right? How much you need to give him, uh, um, take away from him, right? Or so, you know, somebody, right? Somebody, this price goes down, right? How much you can buy more, right? So how much you, you, can, you need to give him in order to not to do the study? Okay, I think it's the easiest thing to think about somebody, okay? EV is this, right? So, um, now we have two measurements, right? It's in terms of money, right? So, that means that if you say, suppose EV, right? If the EV is larger, right? The consumer is better in this new scenario, right? The higher the EV, the consumer better, right? So you can try to compare different tax mechanism, pricing scheme, right? The higher the EV, the he here better, better, right? Or, I mean, of, of course, depends on how you say, maybe they will be more worse off, right? If you compensate, right? But that will be the, look at a measurement of how bidding change, the same as CV, okay? And, The other way run is to look at this from uh, not about the V, but look at the E because that's more simple. Okay. The more simple one is look at okay, CV is under the new price. Okay, the first one, right? Under the new price. Okay, both under the new price. Okay. If I want to get The new happiness and the old happiness. What's the difference? Okay. The difference of how much I need to pay okay, for that. Okay. And EV is looking at the same thing, but this is the new price, okay? And this is the old price. I'm pretty sure you are super confused. I mean. I'm super confused as well, always. So how can you not confuse? Look at the graph, okay? I mean, unless you're working on this problem, you always confuse. The easiest way is look at the graph here, okay? I think it's easier, the most less confusing thing is look at this one, okay? So the assumption of drawing this graph is, I assume 
two thing uh, is the good two mean the same is one okay I'm talking about the price reduction okay so it means that I from here to here right price reduction right good one becomes cheaper okay and we just said about the substitution effect income effect And EV, EV, sorry, CV, okay, CV is exactly the change in the budget from this point to this point. Okay, because CV is looking at the new prices, okay, from the prospect new price. So basically looking at this, how much money you need to compensate, okay, under the new prices, okay. This is measuring change in the utility in term price. Let me repeat the same argument here, All right? And look at the CV, then you, so look at the EV, then you will have the same idea. So like EV is ex ante, look at price the same, okay? So you will be seeing that this shift here, right? How much you can, you need to compensate, right? Looking at, uh, the perspective of a new utility. So this difference, okay? So um, these two, uh, you can't say which one is better, right? Will they look at people entitled to the new stuff or entitled to the old stuff, right? Whether you think which price is more reasonable, right? If original price is market price and not better price, then it might be a good one. But maybe people inter the government intervene is because of the original price is not fair, right? So which is the reference price? I can't say. Okay, so uh, that means that uh, either use EV or CV will be a good measure. Okay, and that justify why. So this is the two graph together. Okay, but this justify why uh, we use consumer surplus. Okay. Um, if you try to write properly, okay, and uh, because of uh, the idea behind this is we have the, uh, or probably we should say, why we have this is because we have the uh, Roy identity and surplus lambda, okay? You integrate the demand function give you the uh, change in uh, the change in the expansion. But anyway, this is the uh, area, okay, under the hexian curve, okay, just to make it more clear, is okay. Uh, I actually can prove it, but I'm not going to do it. Is if you try to remember, is the consumer surplus is the demand under the Marcellian curve. Marcellian demand, right? We just mentioned. You, we learned that the demand or inverse demand, right? So this is the area is we call consumer surplus, right? And here we're trying to tell you that uh, this is not the best, right? The best thing you should look at, not the Demand, but look at the compensated demand. Okay, your compensated demand. Okay, and that means that you do it without the income effect. Look at that demand, and that will be the measure of the welfare. And I'm not going to detail here, but one thing I want to say is, if there are no income effect, right? The Hexian demand and this must the same. So, consumer surplus is same as this two. Right, and if actually can prove it uh, using a graph, it's a good abnormal. Okay, consumer surplus is within the EV, in fields of the EV. You can actually draw it. Uh, do I draw it? Okay, in the case, right? This is uh, look at the normal good. Okay, so. This is the Marcellian demand, okay? 
look at the price changes, go down, right? The change in consumer surplus is this uh, chapre chaprisium under the, this one, right? So change in consumer surplus will be, uh, I don't know, blue color? No, a green color. Right, this is a green one. Okay, and EV is what? EV is looking at which direction? Looking at the area from here. Okay, and the CV is looking at the old old case is here. So the consumer surplus is within the two. Okay. So although itself is not the right concept you're measuring, but it's observing something in the middle. And that's why in the real world, this is the approximation. Okay, because you should measure welfare in terms of hexian, right? Because income change, right? And, uh, but uh, in reality, we will be uh, using the consumer. This is the thing you do. Uh, one of the reasons why we still do consumer surplus in our application because it's easier. Right? Because we often use Marcellian demand when you write a model, right? Where, where we write a model where hexane demand. Right? Because we assume people maximize utility subject to budget constraint rather than subject to some utility level, right? But people feel things by utility level. So that's why uh, this is the result. Okay. So as I said, if you have uh, pricing is small, okay, uh, you can do tail approximation to show that the same thing. Okay. So uh, of course the proof is omitted. Uh, you can check the mass correlation green textbook. They will tell you this is the case. Uh, I guess that's end topic one. I guess I overrun five minutes again. So uh, we will resume at 11.35 and then we'll do the topic two. Okay. Uh, we do producer after that. Okay. I'll go around to see any question because I think I'm a little bit, some little fast, but in any case, ask me.
其他的科技老师也有点，看到，嗯，马赛连，黑色的那个，就马赛连的那个，所以你必须认真的。外出打的时候，就是你开始打的，来你看的，对。就是打电话，你记得吗？那个第一轮那是外省的，就把我喊打过来。那是外省的。外省的是，我喊，是是外省的。你看手上那些都是飞的，刚刚那些都是什么？什么？都打牌的。这里都是牌。嗯。然后很开心的，就是先教，就真的不理解，真的很开心，能进步了。嗯。我们真的不一样。是吧？嗯。现在都没问什么，没有什么作弊的，我们就追求东西好就开始。我们还有什么作弊的？现在都有什么？现在是作弊。
Um, yeah, I go around the break, and some of you uh, think is I go too fast. Some of ping, some people think I go too slow. I think it's good because that means that it's a good balance. And I want to emphasize that although I cover a lot of proof and other concept, right? But just give you an idea how this thing are being derived. I mean, the main thing is you know how to do the Lagrangian, right? As I will do in assignment. And later you expect the same thing in the, in the final exam will be, I give you a utility function, you know how to derive the, uh, the things, right? Derive, say, give you a utility function, you have able to derive the Marcellian demand, right? The uh, indirect utility function, right? You can solve for the uh, Hexian demand, solve for the expanded function, right? Or if more, maybe you able to find the consumer surplus, so the CV and EV, I mean, solve it, I mean, explicitly, and that's it, right? Or that would be the thing we're asking, right? Of course, if I'm, I got more crazy, maybe I try to ask if this, if this utility satisfies certain property, right? And that's the main thing I might, maybe this is satisfied convexity, concavity, there's a center thing we're asking, right? Not, not asking you uh, how to prove, no. The proof is trying to give you the idea, right? As I also mentioned, right? Just like the seminar, right? You go to seminar, you see people doing things, right? And then you just have idea what the guy is doing, right? If you understand in detail, you should you have to read the book or read the paper by yourself, right? Attending the class, right? Same as all other pieces of class, right? Just give you an idea what's going on, and you have to study on your own in order to understand what's going on. I highlight the main thing, right? The assignment tells you what is the main thing among the main thing, right? If you want to have a thoughtful understanding of the subjects, you have to go into detail, right? 
But the problem is none of you, maybe very few of you, will win economics, right? So you just give the idea, right? And then when you need it, you just pick it up, right? Because uh, so now um, I guess is um, what we want to do is look at the producer, okay? And um, what we are doing here is basically talking about a firm, okay? okay? And in this model, if you have a management or operation or organization study, then you are not happy with what I'm doing because I'm just assuming the firm is a black box, okay? A firm will just take input and produce output. Okay. There's a black box, it just gives in, in and then the machine comes out. Okay? There's nothing inside the firm we're studying. Okay? Of course, you're B school. We're in B school, right? This is the actually important thing to open up the black box of the firm to go inside. Okay? And that we will do in game theory section. And if time we talk about agency problem, that will be also the important thing. Okay? So, but here we will make our life easy. To make that the firm, it just, there's no problem with the firm. You just take the input, okay, and convert that to the output. So this is what I'm doing. And the objective of firm is also very simple. We just, is a profit maximizing firm. Okay, it's not going to have any social goal. Okay, it's not maximizing CEO's own benefit. Okay. It's not, there's no u labor union there, so and so forth. Okay, very simple. The firm is price taking firm. He is small, he cannot control the price. Okay, taking the input price, output price uh, given. Okay, of course, later talk about monopoly, but that will be other thing. So everything is perfect competitive. Okay, very nice. So um, how do we do that? Because our uh, firm is, uh, we make it black box, so everything becomes much more simple, right? Because it's unlike human, right? Human is also, or consumer, is also a black box, right? We take some good and produce utility, right? And that part is a little bit more complicated, right? Because human is a complicated object. I mean, the, what's the goal is not very clear. But the firm is very clear, maximize money. Everything can be measured in money term, so things become easy. So first thing to talk about technology, is basically how we uh, transform input to output, okay? And then later we'll talk about cost function. Uh, later we see what it is, but basically just like in order to produce that much of output, uh, uh, what 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 is uh, what is the cost? Okay, later we see. And um, there will be two problems as well: cost minimization and profit maximization. And later you will see these two are slightly different, right? Cost minimization is if I want to produce that much okay, uh, of product, what is the cost minimizing way to do it? How do I combine the input to produce an output and what's the cost associated with that? That is do it internally without taking account into the market, right? The second one is problem maximization is one more step, right? I look at the market. if we're talking about the downward stopping demand curve or profit competition, right? That will give you the profit maximization, okay? So why here we have two steps is because of profit maximization require cost minimization, right? In order to maximize profit, right? You have to internally minimize your cost, right? And that means that cost minimization is a simple problem. So that's why we do it in this way, right? Although we're talking profit maximizing firm, but cost minimization is the first thing to do, and then we talk about profit maximization. And that means that even you consider a case where firms are in game theory idea is interacting, right? Then you would you would uh, still the cost cost minimization will still be doing, right? Of course, uh, last we look at product surplus. Turn to be very simple. I just give you a spoil a spoiler alert. Product surplus is just profit, so there's nothing to learn here. But that it is okay. So um, let's go. Let's get started. Uh, why 
why the firm is maximize the profits, okay? I guess that's, uh, go back to the idea of Milton Friedman, one of the uh, a great economists from Chicago. He think, I mean, if you know Chicago school, which thinks market is often very good, right? And the idea why we only focus on this is, if a firm is not making profit focus on, they, you were beaten by other, right? And, uh, and also you know, using the capital market idea, right? If, you, if we want the firm to perform other function, right? Actually with efficient market, capital market, actually you don't need that, right? You can have firms specialized in making profit and something else, something some other enterprise focus on doing something else then it will be more efficient, right? Of course, you assume there's some nice capital market, then things would do well, okay? So here we maximize sales and maximize, they maximize sales and market share. That's fine, but then the problem will be a little bit different, okay? And that actually go back to the last class, okay? We assume consumer maximize their own utility. Right, and actually, that often economists receive criticism of saying people are selfish, but that is wrong. Okay, because of you can model it, people care others. There's no problem. You just maximize the objective. It's just not about your utility, but other people utility as well. Right, the approach we do has no problem to incorporate people uh, caring others, right? But of course, your bundle has to be more difficult, right? It's not just about yours, but uh, you have to specify the consonant bundle is not yours, but also others, right? And the things are more complicated. Same here. If you care about the firm, it's not just maximizing its own profit, but also maybe suppose that the firm is a conglomerate or a length company, right? You also maximize your profit, and also maybe you say some, you also own other firm as well, right? Say maybe say uh, when, I don't know, maybe uh, what example? Uh, example maybe uh, Alibaba, right? Also own something like the Ants Financial, right? Then when he make price decision, he also take into account a profit uh, externality to that, right? That is also possible in this framework. But in our model, we assume uh, every firm is taking a profit in its own firm, okay? If you want to have some interlocking ownership, then it's also doable, okay? Actually, some research also do that, right? And that paper talking about uh, firms' behavior when uh, especially uh, uh, they are related there's a, some common ownership, right? Say, say for example, we look at uh, firms like, especially the new economy, look at Alibaba, Tenmao, and all the firms, right? Maybe they're related to SoftBank and some other big investment company. And how they do things are very different, right? Because they don't want to burn a lot of money, right? I mean, because you burn, they burn, and so on and so forth. But so, uh, there are a lot of, some research papers talking about those, right? What happened when you've come on ownership, right? But anyway, uh, that is the idea, okay? And I'm not going to detail on that, but uh, if you do concept theory, game theory, then you'll be there, right? And those people from finance, right? The corporate finance here, the whole huge book talking about open up the box of the firm, but this is not our concern in this class, okay? Say, um, utility is transforming goods into utility, okay? Same as firm, uh, production is from input to output, okay? So the idea we are using is same idea, right? The consumption is a vector of numbers, goods, and production is also transforming things from one to the other, okay? And in most generic term is a little bit trickier, here is the vector. And this vector include input and output, okay? And input is negative, 
output positive. Okay, so put it this way: if you have considered two good well, a firm is able to produce two units of good two using one unit of good one. Okay, generically here is one firm is able to produce three units of good three using one unit of good one and two units of good two. Okay, so that's the idea. So this is the most generic thing because this allow multiple input and multiple output. Okay, so that is the why probably if you learn but now probably no one do it. It's called the input output table, right? It's a matrix of here this thing input this output and this is very natural thing to look at, right? But um, it's most generic. But uh, in our class. We focus on single output firm, okay, to make our life easy. But everything, if you look at Mars Collaboration Green, they would it holds for everything. Look at Jethil and Randy. Uh, we follow Jethil and Randy, so we focus on single output firm, okay. And of course, you can imagine multiple output firm can have some more easel there, right? The complements up to you, production and this here and there, but we just make our life easy, okay. And um, here we have a set of feasible production plan. That is the production possibility set, right? That means that this is a technology that have restriction, right? Compared to consumer, he can consume whatever he can consume, right? We don't assume that there's some limitation how you can consume, right? But for firm, this is real possibility, right? I mean, how much you can produce is determined by how good is your machine? How good is technology? So this set Y uh, is an important constraint. Okay. So as I said, we follow the textbook we are using, Jotiro and Rani, where we will be using a single output. Okay. And um, and for our easy of representation use y as the output okay a single dimension okay and input are all called x okay and input and one output okay so don't confuse with the one previous slide why is it production plan okay but we just focus on we don't want to use negative and positive right so everything positive use x positive y okay because this is easier to connect you with the intermediate or principal class right or the x Put this Y. Okay. And to represent the production plan is this, right? All the input and put up. Okay. And where commonly in the intermediate, right? Inputs are capital and labor, right? And of course, in gener general, right? There are many capital, many labor, right? So that's why it's that generic, right? But you can summarize it into capital and labor. Okay. And I want to remind you one thing is uh, just give me a remind is uh, whether you can aggregate capital. It's a complicated thing. Actually, they call the Cambridge Cambridge debate. Uh, it's a Cambridge in the UK and Cambridge in US, which is Harvard, MIT. Uh, and they argue how you can aggregate capital, whether it's possible or not. And actually, related to finance, right? how you can aggregate capital. It was a deep problem. But anyway, yes. We're not going into that debate anyway. So um, same as we make assumption on utility, right? We assume monotone, continuous, uh, cosy concave. Uh, we will do the same here. Okay. Uh, we have, have the continuous, slowly increasing, and cosy concave. Same, right? And one additional thing here, I think, is doesn't exist in the utility is. If you don't give me anything, I cannot produce something, right? So, uh, but of course, you can assume the same for utility. You can, you can normalize it to zero, but we don't have to. But for this, the real world, right? You cannot produce things from nothing, right? So, but we do have to explain why we make this assumption, okay? The first one, continuous, I think is very natural, right? If you change the input slightly, Output to change slightly, right? Suppose you LA you make your CPU slightly faster, right? So then make output increase a lot, 
right? But I mean, we often have this claim, right, from some of my students, not her, but some student, right? They say, oh, uh, I can't do the paper uh, because uh, I have some issue last night, okay? Right? I can't prove this because uh, my mom is sick, right? And I can't attend the exam because of what reason, right? And you claim something small, but you claim the output change a lot, right? But that is the claim, right? Your reproduction function is continuous, right? You claim, this day there's a ring, and so that's why I, don't, I didn't have time to do the paper, right? Or uh, uh, the power is off last night, so I can't write the paper. I mean, right? But you can imagine the small change to the big change is not continuous, okay? And this is really increasing. It's like increased output, increased input, increased output, very natural. I think we don't explain is this cosy concave. Okay? Remember in, in remember the utility, right? We say cosy concave means that when we combine two possible consumption plan, right? The combination is better than worse of the two. Right? I think someone asked me in the break. Uh, about the uh, coffee and the Mao Tai, right? And he mentioned that, okay, uh, actually separating coffee and Mao Tai is better than give me the joint, okay? But when we talk about causing con concavity, it's not about mixing the two things. It's asking, suppose I give you two bottles of Mao Tai or two bottles of coffee. You ask me which one you like the least, okay? And compared to the case I give you, one bottle of Mao Tai, one bottle of coffee. Not mixing. You mix, you can mix, but you don't have to mix. Then you say combine these two things better than the worst of two. Okay? And here, same idea. Okay? Is remember capital and labor story. Okay? You give me the case of two machines or two people. Tell me, you can tell me based on technology which one is less productive, maybe to labor, okay? And then I always say, give me one capital and one labor, it's better than two labor. That is the cost of concave, okay? It, does it always hold? I don't know, it need not be, but this assumption we make, this is a classical assumption. If you violate in your application, then you derive everything from scratch, okay? The reason that we need to understand the assumption behind is because we see can we use other people's result? If that's true, then you don't, it saves your life, right? If it doesn't apply, then you have to derive from the beginning. Of course, if you derive from the beginning, actually it's easier. If it doesn't follow this, you can imagine a solution will be just corner. But just like if your preference is not cosy concave, what happens is you would have corner solution, right? So if, suppose, remember the, the coffee and the Mao Tai case, right? Suppose you don't like, Mix, right? Either you drink coffee to die to death or you drink multi to die, right? Then it's very simple, right? You don't like the mix, so just the answer would be either you just multi or coffee. You don't have any intermediate. So actually, life is even easier. Okay, here, cosy concave, right? So average of the two possible planets is better, okay? And I reiterate, it means that there's a complement, okay? It's not substitute. It's a material that doesn't work, right? And I guess with your AI these days, probably some of you may actually do research on that because AI become more popular these days. And AI is probably substitute, I guess, right? I mean, a low level AI is a complement. A very smart AI likely to be substitute, right? And why is that so? Because, I mean, some people, I mean, there's a research talking about people doing coding, now the salary drops, okay? Because of, now you have AI, then substitute you, right? I mean, AI can do the thing. But anyway, in that case, that probably, uh, this doesn't hold any wall. Okay. But anyway, uh, let's go. So quickly, here is some definition. I don't think I need to describe very in detail. Just give you the idea what the terms because they, you often see it in the paper or in the proof or in the this ID. That's very simple. Marginal product. Marginal product is just like increase one unit of input, how many output you can get. Okay. That's very simple. 
Okay, for those who haven't learned economics, marginal just saying you change something slightly, how much you change the other. Okay, I mean if you don't know economics that little bit, slightly slightly difficult, but just like margin, just like slightly change one unit of input, how many output you can get. Okay, I mean to me now after twenty years of talking about marginal, then I know very well. It's like instinct to me, but when I learn it, the marginal is always difficult, right? Uh, and the focus on differentiation, right? Just like change, small change. Okay. And if f is really increasing, which we assume, this marginal product is always positive, right? Very simple. Nothing deep here. Okay. And here is, uh, we often assume this whole, okay? But it need not always hold, but we all often, often assume this is uh, the marginal product is diminishing, okay? Getting more labor, okay, is not going to work as well as the first, basically, the first unit of labor, okay, has higher marginal product than the second unit and the third unit. Okay, that is what it means. Usually, what it said is usually it's congestion idea, right? So you keep the same capital, you get more labor, labor have to wait for the capital to work out. So that's the idea, right? That's some construction story. But if there's no construction story, that I'm not sure it holds, like capital, right? Look at people now, the computing power. Getting more computing power is more likely actually is increasing, right? Because you're actually getting more computer power, gets less congestion. So this did not hold. So be careful what assumption you're making when you do application. Okay? But of course, this is the thing we also usually, usually assume in the classical production. But now, these days, probably this doesn't hold anymore. Because adding capital actually getting increasing return. Right? Getting faster computer, faster and faster actually, actually is more productive. Okay? But, but I just want to mention this is a standard thing we assume. Okay? So if you violate this, what happened? Naturally, you would expect is you basically go to all capital, right? no more labor. Okay? The reason why we assume this is because we want some interior solution, right? Some capital labor will be higher, right? It's more natural. But if you think that your environment is like, as I said, right, it's increasing, there's no substitute. We say the capital labor are substitute rather than complement, then actually probably you will end up in all the capital, which we expect to be. But that's how you derive things different from the classical world, right? Because the classical world is everyone knows how to do it, right? So this definition, nothing new, it's just like average product, it's just dividing how many of them. Okay, nothing, nothing deep here. Okay. And isoquant, isoquant is exactly the same case as we see in difference curve. In difference curve is collection of the bundle that gives you the same utility or the same for you the same. Isoquant is the set of production plan that give you the same output, right? So isoquant, right? So if you have cos C concave production function, your isoquant, it's just like a uh, curve downward, right? It's just like that, right? Same as what we said if uh, x1, x2, if you have the standard assumption we make, this is the shape we have, right? And go to the northeast direction, it's going to increase, right? Because of the increasing, right? And the shape like this is because uh, uh, is because we assume that complement, right? Cause a concave. Okay. So this is the thing. Uh, you can you can easily actually see where right? because of this assumption you have a unique solution, right? Because all the assumptions we make here. So this is the graph, right? Uh, go into this direction, you would have a higher ISO point, right? And because of why the ISO point is not a set, it's a line, because of so we increasing, right? Increase more input, so we increase more output. So this is the assumption we made, okay? And the name here is very simple, right? MLS with MLTS, right? The same idea. MLS, remember, is what? Is you keep your utility the same. If you give up one unit of good I, how many units of good J you need to make you as happy as before? Okay, here same. 
if I use less one unit of good I as input, right? And how many good J input I need in extra to make sure that I pull the same amount. Let me repeat because it's exactly the same thing, right? In difference curve, right? The slope is the MLS, right? Because of that itself tells me I hold my to the same, I give up one unit of good I, how many good J I need to make me as same as before? Same here. I draw the graph here, right? The isocon here, right? And this gives me, if I want to keep my same production level, if I use one unit less of I, how many J I need to put it in, make sure that I get the same production, okay? And this isocon, you can imagine it optimal, same as the input prices. Input price ratio will be equal to this one because again, the story is saying internal exchange rate, external one. But anyway, we'll talk about this later. But this is the idea, you know, MLTS, okay? So um, here, uh, later we talk about diminishing return, uh, uh, which I, I haven't defined here, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, we, well, let me define it easily. We call a later. We will put it. I, I define it. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me define this. Return to scale first. Return to scale is asking the following thing: If I double my input, is it going to double my output? Okay. If I double my input, I double my output. Then it's constant return to scale. If my double my input does not double my output, is uh, decreasing. If more than double, then it's increasing, right? Just the scale up and down. And um, in, in general, we assume the case is uh, constant or decreasing, mainly decreasing, okay? One of the reasons why in economics we assume is decreasing return scale is because if increasing return scale, one firm will take out the market, right? Because it's getting bigger, 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 bigger. Then it's not a nice thing to do, but if you come from an information system or you come from finance, you know there's an economy of scale, right? And in that case, then probably, I mean, you will see a natural monopoly over there, right? So that's why in generics, most of the time we assume decreasing the scale, right? Just like you double your, double your input, cannot double your output, okay? And you may ask, what is the rationale behind this assumption, right? Why double input can double output? One of them is basically managerial reason, is that you can't double the CEO, right? Say, if you think uh, Elon Musk is a good entrepreneur, right? You cannot replicate him, right? So you just give more capital and labor, it's not going to make the firm twice as large as before. So in some sense, it means that somehow, some input is not modeling in this. It's just like, it kind of like, uh, your production function is not fully specified. There's some things that, that is not, cannot be put in input, it's like discrete, right? So Elon Musk is like discrete guy. It cannot be replicated, right? Or something's not marketable, or something is not there, so that's why you cannot double, right? Because in principle, right? If you, for experiment, everything replicate, Everything to replicate, even technology, right? But things because there's not generic, there's something that is cannot be replicated, then you have this, right? Or some production require luck, right? They probably have this, right? Uh, that's why it's not, there's something like this, okay? Um, so the grand reason scale. So one thing I want to mention is this is, we often we have dimension to scale, and I want to uh, tell you that there is a diminishing MLTS, which often we assume uh, is not the same thing, okay? Because we often see this uh, is uh, we require this uh, dimension MLTS, which is a concave, right? In order for the solution to work, so it's not sufficient, okay? Um, that is, I want to say, okay, um, because 
we often assume this hole, okay? And this thing holds, I think it's very natural because we assume something is all replicatable, right? That's fine. And this thing, right? We need to assume, remember why we that is complementarity. Okay, so that's why basically saying complementarity and something kind of replicatable is not the same thing. Okay, uh, just make sure that you know, uh, don't confuse them, okay? Now, um, here, I uh, want to talk about homogen, homogeneity, homogeneous. I think you learned it in the math, math camp, but just definition in the math. It's called homogeneous degree K, means that if you take lambda factor to the input, you will lambda raise the power k to the output. Okay. And if constant return to scale, um, that means that the uh, lambda is at the k is one, right? Double the input, double the output. Okay. And uh, one thing in the math, okay, this second point is basically from the math, okay? It's Euler theorem is uh, the marginal product is homogeneous degree one. Uh, I mean, uh, if you don't math it, then you can forget about the second point because uh, it's often in the textbook, so that's why I put it there. Okay. So I guess that would be an important theorem that uh, why we often in practice we always assume the product function is concave. Okay, that would give us a nice outcome is if continuous three increasing zero, three constant, this is what we assume, okay? As long as this is not increasing with the scale, then it's concave. Let me repeat. The first line is, I don't think we have any issue because this is the assumption that we've been using, right? Continuously increasing zero and zero and cos concave. So what's new here is homotic degree is no more than one, okay? That means that it's either decreasing return or constant return, okay? Remember constant return is what? Double input, double output. Less than one means double input, output less than double, okay? So if you have these two, that's concave, okay? And why we want to know this theorem is because in practice, we are too lazy. We just assume f is concave directly, okay? Then you have to know what we are assuming is if we assume this, then we have this. So this is very natural, right? Because I think it's, as I said, except very special case, uh, when you analyze, right, the, decree, the constant return or decreasing return is very natural, right? If you accept this, f is concave. So life is easy, right? So that, that's why in the intermediate cost, we just assume concave and done, right? And that gives you the foundation why we can assume that, right? So um, I think that is good, same as why it gives you the idea why the preference, right? We, make, we tell you what is the assumption on the preference, right? And give you the utility function, same here, right? We have some concave, we tell you, you make some assumption on technology, that is what you get, right? Because technology here is from the ISO point, right? As long as you assume there's some complementarity, assume decreasing return scale, that's concave. I hope that gives you the idea why you make those assumptions. Okay. Uh, this is a proof. I don't think we need the proof. So I just skip. If you want to read, you can read. Uh, this the, you can find also the more detailed proof in the Jeter and Rennie if you want to look at that. Okay, I'm not going to go there, okay? And same as the utility function, remember we have several common form, right? Perfect substitute, perfect complement, Copdoculus, same here. We have three things. Here is perfect linear production, is actually perfect, perfect substitute, right? Because no matter how you swap one and two, linear, okay? Perfect substitute. And you have what we call fixed proportion or called the right? You need both 
say man and machine to work, right? One people, one computer, right? And then that's that's the idea. Okay. And lastly, as I said, this coplocalus. Okay. And probably you would ask uh, why coplocalus so famous? Coplocalus coming from uh, empirical data in macro. Okay. So none of you do macro anyway, but if you do macro, this is the model that they were using because they use the data from the macro in the US, econ macroeconomic data, and figure out that capital and labor would fit this very well. Okay? Uh, of course, these days, uh, because of the globalization, this become less stable, but Cobb Douglas DU, uh, the model people use in macro. I mean, of course, they're a more complicated one, but this is a, a good approximation. Okay? Um, let me cover this. I think the last 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 slide because I don't have time to go over. Uh, so um, this is uh, uh, elasticity substitution, okay? And this definition is super crazy, okay? What is said is okay. Um, what log the MRTS, which I think there's no problem, okay? And this is a lot, the denominator is changed in the ratio input. Okay? So, what does that mean? Uh, I draw a graph and then we should end here. So suppose we have a good one and good two. Okay? And if isocon here, right? And you remember this is. The MLTS, right? Uh, sorry for my, because I can't really draw on the, yeah, sorry for my, I, I can't use the pen, I don't know why. So I use the mouse, then it's not going to look nice, okay, anyway. Okay, and look at the ratio, means what? Meso means this, right? This is R, okay? And what is asking if this is you do some change on this one with the ratio, right? And how this MLT has changed. Let me repeat just like you make one presentation in R, how is the red change? So, a little better than curvature, right? So, I'm this is completely in, unintuitive to me. No matter what, no matter what you say, many times I never understand why they define this way. <laughs> but I mean, just one slide. So just now it's good. Is the reason why we do this is this is used in in the uh, uh, like the CES model. This is the model we use uh, adding up, and this is the standard thing you see in the applied literature, the Potter function. This includes the three common thing we have. Okay, let's stop here. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.